Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being with us. I'm sorry again for yesterday um, technical problems. We're going to go all over again from, from the beginning on, uh, of the lecture on uh, behavioral finance. It's actually behavioral finance one. Those of you who looked at my LinkedIn uh, ad or the Facebook, I put a list of the rest of the lecture that we'll have and precise dates. Um, I left the last one um, to be announced, TBA. I haven't, I haven't determined the, the, the topic yet, but it, it's gonna be one of the following three. Um, the first one is, the first one's title is The Spread of Herd. The second one is The Game of Blame. And the third one is gender and behavior, okay? One of them is going to, to be the last lecture. Um, if you have preferences, you can express these in either my Facebook or LinkedIn or uh, by email, okay? And now we are uh, with behavioral finance, emotion versus con uh, cognition. And I'm gonna talk about financial decision-making. Okay. Uh, okay, and, and um, I'm going. I'm going to talk about bounded rationality in investment, and I'll start by saying that whenever we talk about decision making and rationality, we actually talk about two two components. One is beliefs, and the other is actions. When we make a decision. Uh, when we pursue some objective, we first form beliefs about the possible outcomes, the possible consequences, and based on these beliefs, we decide about the action, okay? And when we talk about rationality in the framework of uh, finance, we're going to see that uh, bounded rationality applies both in the case of beliefs, as well as in the case of actions, okay? What, what we need in order to um, form rational beliefs is that we'll be, uh, we'll be processing information correctly, okay? Irrationality in belief may mean a variety of things, may mean um, incapability of assessing probability correctly, or ignoring certain information parts when, asset, when building beliefs. There may be a variety of aspects and we'll, we're going to discuss them. Uh, and, and once we have beliefs, we're used, as I said, we're using these beliefs in order to decide, uh, decide on an action that would maximize our objectives. Usually we refer to this objective uh, as utility function, okay? So the human biases and deviations from rationality, as I said, are both in the level of beliefs as well as in the level of action given beliefs, okay? Um, and what I'm going to argue is that these biases, these deviations are not only, not only applied to small investors, okay? Not only small investors or a small investor is prone to, to be affected by these biases, also very experienced portfolio managers or brokers or uh, people who are well educated in, in making financial decisions. They're all also, also these people are exposed to these biases. Okay. And the reason as I pointed out, is that much of these biases are not coming from limited cognition, are not, are not because we are stupid or, or because we are uh, not intelligent enough to, um, to make the right calculations. Often financial decision making means very little in terms of math and in terms of calculation. Much of these biases are built on our emotional system. Most of these, most of the biases are not caused by our cognition, limit, cognitive limitation. 
but by emotions. And this is one of the reasons um, why, um, why these biases um, are prone to affect not only people who are not familiar with financial decision making, but also peer, big portfolio managers, okay? It's hard to avoid them, okay? Now let's go to this scheme that describe basically the two components that I was referring to. We're talking about beliefs, okay? We're talking about actions. Each of them is being affected by both emotions and cognition. And if you look at the size of these fonts, it will tell you something. In both cases, emotions are more prominent or, or, more, or, or more, more responsible to biases than cognition. But I would say that in action, when we talk about biases in terms of the actions, then the difference between emotions and cognition is the greatest. Emotion play a greater role uh, in our biases also when it, when it gets to beliefs. But it plays much, much greater role when we discuss the biases that involve actions, okay? And we'll see, we'll go back one by one. Now, the first thing to ask is why is it important? Why is it interesting, okay? And, and more specifically, does these biases, do these biases say something about the market? Okay, maybe some people have biases, maybe some people have more biases than others, but these biases and, uh, will, will vanish in the market because some people who can fight these biases, either because they are more in intelligent and can set aside the cognitive biases, or because they emotionally are more trained and can overcome their emotion better, Maybe these, these type of investors may take the opportunity, okay, and exploit the stupidity, quotation mark, of the biased investors and make them vanish, make them go dis, uh, dis, inst, distinct, right? Uh, how can it be? It can be, for instance, and I'm, I'm asking the question, and, and I'll very soon we'll come with a negative answer to this. Uh, how does the market react to irrationality? Can a small group of rational player correct the market by means of arbitrage, right? Suppose that most people are biased and there is just very small uh, super individuals that can avoid these biases, okay? These people would be able, if, even if they are not interested in investing themselves, Potentially, we would say these individuals would um, uh, cause the uh, biased investor to vanish. How would they do it? Well, they'll do arbitrage. What does it mean they'll do arbitrage? If there is a certain stock that is underrated by biased investors, okay, uh, because it's wor worth much more, okay, they would simply buy it from these biased investors for cheap, okay? And then go with this stock to the market, okay? Um, and, um, and sell it, okay? And by selling it, they will sell it with a higher price. Uh, they bought for cheap, they sold for more, they made profit, okay? And if this is the case, that would cause basically the biased individual to disappear. They'll buy all their stocks um, or sell stocks to them in a way that bias, the bias will disappear from the market simply by means of arbitrage. And, the, and, 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 and is this the case? I mean, uh, if this is the case, we, we don't have to worry too much at the level of the market about bias in financial decision making. But it's not the case, okay? Arbitrage won't um, make these biased decisions disappear from the market for several reasons. One of it is that um, 
searching for arbitrage opportunities is costly, okay? So even if you could do it, uh, you, 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 people won't necessarily find these opportunities, although they are in the market. Um, to do so, you also, if you want to engage in arbitrage, buy stocks for low and sell them for high, uh, or the other way, uh, yeah, um, um, then you will have to, uh, if you don't want to engage yourself, if you don't want to engage yourself in taking risk, you will have to, had to do some hedging in order to avoid potential risk, which is very complicated, okay? Uh, not very excessive, okay? And it is an evident, okay, that there are limit, limits to arbitrage. It is an evidence that there are a lot of um, gaps in the market that point out at a certain level of irrationality that takes place in the market, okay? One example is the issue of indexing, okay? When a stock enters the index, let's say the NASDAQ, its value is appreciated by 3.5%, okay? On average, in the same trading day, okay? And this effect may even survive for the long run. Now, the fact that the stock entered the index by itself does not indicate something fundamental about the value of the company, okay? Yet, the fact that it's in the, the index, um, maybe it attracts a lot of attention by individual, maybe by funds. Um, it's the, the fund effect is not, is not the only effect. There's definitely salience effect that is uh, due to private investors. Um, and it indicates that um, uh, a value of a stock may rise without having any fundamental reasons for this increase in value, okay? There are more examples, but I'm not going to, um, to devote too much time for this issue. I'm going to immediately move to discuss the individual, okay? and limited rationality at the level of beliefs. I'm going to talk about the individual and start with uh, some examples of barriers to rational behavior, okay, that apply on our belief part of the decision-making, okay? Now, what, what could be, what could be, what could generate irrational beliefs? One thing that can generate irrational belief is uh, incorrect internalization of information. Okay? Misreading of facts. Okay? If we read newspapers about firms and we, um, or if we read newspapers about uh, COVID-19 uh, or read data about COVID-19 and we are selectively pick the type of information that we, let's say, understand or that we hope will be the truth, we get a distorted picture of reality. We form beliefs which are incorrect, okay? And that happens very, very often. The other thing that we, we very often suffer from, and this is purely cognitive, the first one is not necessarily cognitive, I'm, I'm going to um, elaborate on this, but something which is definitely much more cognitive is uh, our weak probabilistic intuition. We don't, do, we don't work well with probabilities, okay? We don't have good intuition uh, that he, about probability and about the way the law of probability operate, okay? Um, not even people who are professional and, and sometimes people who work in prob probability theory, if you can ask them, you give them a certain uh, slightly complicated event, that uh, what's, what's the probability that A will occur conditional on B occurring, you will see that their immediate intuition will be very incorrect. They'll have to work out the computation Fortunately, people who are familiar with 
probability theory, can do the computation correctly. Most, most of us don't do the computation to assess probabilities. And because our intuition is, is misleading us very often in terms of probabilities, we get a distorted picture of reality. Okay? Another thing that often, uh, uh, very often happens when we confront information is the phenomena that we call anchoring, okay? And let me start by giving you an example uh, of um, anchoring, okay? Suppose that um, I'm gonna ask you the question, the following question, how many African countries have a UN membership, okay? This is a question that I pose to you. Okay, uh, and this is indeed the question that was, uh, that was posed to a subject in an experiment. Um, subject were asked this question, and then, okay, those who were asked this question were first primed with one of the following questions. Okay, before, before being asked this question, they were asked, is the number of African UN members state more or less than 15? Okay, this is one group. The other group was primed with a different question. Is the number of African UN member state more or less than 100? So there was one group with, were confronted with question A, there was another group that was confronted with question B, and then both group were asked the question that I started with. How many African countries have a UN membership? Okay, now what do you think happened? Those people who were first confronted with question A basically said, mentioned numbers around 15, maybe 20, maybe 12, they were around 15, and especially those people who have very little knowledge about the, the original questions. How many African countries have a UN membership? Instead, those who were confronted with question B before the main questions, those people gave numbers which are almost 10 times higher than the other group because they were confronted, they were primed with a number which is 100. Okay, so they would say maybe 90, maybe 85, maybe 120, okay? So the priming affected the, question, the answer to the main question, okay? This is what we call anchoring. They were anchored with this number that were suggested to them in the first place, although this number may have nothing to do with the correct answer, okay? But the fact that they were confronting this number, okay, um, they were they were they gave a totally different answer, uh, whether they were part of Group A or part of Group B. Okay, there are other examples, experiments that uh, demonstrate this phenomenon of anchoring. Okay, if you if you try to do it, you will ask people, for instance, uh, there have been experiments of the following, for, uh, uh, the following uh, sort. Um, uh, you ask people first the last digit of their ID number. Okay, so some people have this last digit one, zero, or two. Others would have this last digit being eight or nine. Okay, and then you ask people to give, uh, to choose a number between zero and, and 10, or you ask these people to guess what the last G digit of uh, Donald Trump's ID number, okay? And what you will see is that those people who named their last digit to be high will give higher number, will attribute higher number to the last digit of Donald Trump than those who were primed by a low number for the last digit in their ID number, okay? 
So it, it, it's, it's a very important bias that can be exploited, right? If you want people to, um, for instance, in negotiation, this is something that is very often being exploited. This is, this is very often called the first mover advantage. If you are negotiating with somebody and you have a, an opportunity to name the first price, okay, and you start with a very high price, you anchor, you already anchor your counterpart, okay, towards the price that you named. Okay, so if you are a seller and you name a high price, your chances of getting more out of the buyer are greater when you name the higher price initially than, you, than when you let the buyer name the high price and he names a very low one, okay? If you are a buyer and you're first mover and you offer a very low price to start with, you'd better off be the first proposer because by making a first very low offer, your chances of keeping the agreement offer low is higher if you propose a low offer first, okay? Now this is just an one example of how anchoring can actually uh, affect decision-making in way of exploiting, um, exploiting it to, to the benefit of the, the person who is aware of this bias, okay? Of course, if the other party in this negotiation is, is also aware of anchoring, being the first mover is not gonna be a for, a, an easy task for you because the other party would want, obviously, to be the first mover as well, okay? But when one party is aware of biases and the other party is not aware of biases, there's certainly a certain advantage, strategic advantage, to the party that is familiar with the bias. Then we have time and place biases in updating probabilities. What, what, do, I, what do I am referring to? Okay. Um, we're giving more weight to events that are recent in time and closer in geography, in distance. Okay. If I, uh, if I tell you that, um, that uh, I yesterday met somebody who um, was contracted with COVID-19, okay, you would feel much more, not, not seeing me, but you would feel much more scared about the disease than when I tell you that I met him like two weeks ago, okay? Although this specific incident impinges almost nothing about how the disease, what the disease is doing, or what, what, uh, what the, how risky the disease is at this particular moment. Okay, the same applies. The same applies to um, to geography. Okay, if I tell you that. Um, that there was a case um, of COVID-19 just across the, your street, right? You would be terrified in terms of this disease much more than when you were told that uh, it was um, three or four kilometers away from you. Okay? And these, these have a certain, a certain degree of reason in them, but in most cases, uh, the, the information that, that this piece of evidence is giving to you is too little to derive anything meaningful, yet it affects our, it affects our beliefs and it's affect them in a way of an emotional reaction to some extent. Okay, we just, uh, we just, uh, we just, feel an impulse of certain degree of fear when we are told that something bad happened around us or near us, whether near means time 
or distance. Okay, we assign salience to events that have higher higher probability. Okay. Um, Sorry, we as, we, what, what we do, we assign a uh, salient event a higher probability. So for instance, if, we, if I'm going to tell you that, um, uh, that if, if you're going to hear that there was a, 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 some terror attack somewhere and the, and the media will keep talking about it, okay? Or some murder took place somewhere, uh, and and it wouldn't only mention once, you know, it wouldn't only be mentioned once, but there will be a lot of media activities around this event. Okay, uh, let's say some crime took place, and there's there's a, a huge media interest in this crime. Okay, you will assign a higher probability that such event could could happen, uh, let's say within the next two months than when it didn't attract so much attention by the media, okay? The media would be attracted to report on crime for all sorts of reasons, not because they are very likely, very often because they are very unlikely. Nevertheless, the fact that it's being reported, the fact that it's salient, generate a perception in us that it's also very frequent, okay? So we are very hard to distinguish between salience and frequency. We associate salience with frequency, whether the, whereas these two things are, are very often unrelated, okay? What is risk of being affected but what is the risk of being affected by a terrorist attack in Paris? Okay, it's very, very slim. Okay, it was even very slim during the period in which terror attack took place in Paris, right? Um, we, don't, we don't recognize this as such, okay? We, if it's small, why do we, why do we're afraid of events that are, have very, very small probabilities? Okay. This is the same, this is the same aspect. We often ignore the incentives of parties who influence our beliefs. Okay, sometimes we are provided information Okay, by an interested party, somebody is, is, is willing to convince us that something is true, okay? We very often take this information on face value. We very little, very, very, very rarely, we are going to, uh, to get into the incentives, okay, which is sometimes, Definitely, we, when we don't like the piece of information, or when we suspect the person is providing this type of information, we will, we will try to, to ask the question, why is he telling it to us, okay? But very often, if we, if we don't uh, have reason to suspect the person, to have suspicion about the person, uh, and still, even if the interest of the person in providing the information is very, very clear, we rarely go into we rarely go into the question of why why is it why is it reported to us, okay? And of course, these uh, allow us or these force us, I would say, uh, to develop distorted distorted beliefs because uh, we get obviously we get the kind we we get uh, more salient in terms of those pieces of information that other people have incentive in delivering these to us. Let me give you an example. Uh, several uh, years ago when the terror attack in Boston took place, 
I wrote the piece in the Los Angeles Times. Uh, that was a time in which um, basically people refused to leave home because of the fear of terror immediately after the anxiety that was caused by these terror attacks in Los Angeles. Uh, or sorry, in Boston, that took place in Boston. And what I did, I looked at the data we had, I remember that we had in Israel a very similar situation following terror attacks in which people had a totally distorted, total dis completely distorted belief about risk. And what I was referring, what I'm referring to is the period that took place in Israel um, during what is called the Intifada, the uprising by the Palestinians that took place 2001, 2002, okay? Uh, this was an awful period because the, the level of anxiety was, was quite similar uh, to the one that we experienced during the beginning of COVID-19. Basically, many, many restaurants and shops were shut down because people were afraid to leave their home, okay? And what I did, I looked at the number of casualties that we experienced in Israel during this period of 2001, 2002, the, the peak of the Intifada, okay? And it turned out that during this entire period, the number of casualties from violence, okay, from, I'm talking about violence, uh, either terror attack or, or, or killing or street killing or whatever, not necessarily political violence, all type of violence, the total casualties in all type of violence in the entire state of Israel was smaller than I think two months in one city in the United States. Okay, a city that nobody uh, is intimidated to walk in the streets. Um, uh, I mentioned Chicago, but then the editor of the Los Angeles Times uh, was, was so surprised to see it that she uh, tested these numbers also for Los Angeles and a few other cities. And it turned out that my, my assertion was correct, not only about Chicago, but also about Los Angeles and, and several other cities, okay? I'm talking about the time that we, here in Jerusalem, uh, at the university, we invited several academics to conferences in Israel during this period from Chicago, from Los Angeles, from other places in the US. And they refused to come to Israel because they said it's, it's, it's very risky, you know, why? How can we dare going to Israel? Well, Israel at that time were a few times safer than Los Angeles and Chicago. And these people were living in Los Angeles and Chicago, okay? And the reason why they were so, they had so much distortion in their beliefs about risk, there are two aspects to it. Uh, but one is the dominant. The dominant one is that Israel was on the news every day, every night, not only night, from the morning to the evening, right? And everything that was reported about Israel was, um, was violence, okay? So it's salience, but I'm talking about academics. I'm talking about people who, um, who are professors in economics and statistics. They know how to read data. They know how to assess risk. They could look at the data, they could look at the numbers and see that life are not are, are way safer in Israel than in Los Angeles. But no, they could not do it. They could not do it because the reaction, the basic reaction is emotional. It's emotional to the extent that you say to yourself, even if I see the evidence, I'll still be afraid to travel to Israel. 
okay? This is an example of salience distort, distorting our beliefs, okay? And let us believe that something is more, is more dangerous or something is more, has a, has a higher probability of occurring than it actually has, okay? Then we're talking about stiffness of beliefs. This is once you've already formed your belief, okay? When we, we tell people as economists, if you form beliefs and you get more information, you should update your beliefs. I mean, those who study economics know about Bayesian rules, right? Okay, um, we have beliefs. We can use ba what we call Bayesian updating. Okay, we, we, we have to incorporate the new information that we get and reassess our beliefs. This is the alphabet of Decision-making, correct decision-making at the level of beliefs, okay? We have enormous difficulty to practice it. In theory, it sounds great, but when it gets to being practiced, we fail. And when I say we, I include myself. Well, I know a little bit about behavioral economics, so I can sometimes tell to myself, look, yeah, hey, this is ridiculous. You, you have to think, you know, you have to take care of, of your biases and uh, act more rationally. But it's not, it's not something that comes easy. Even for somebody like me who works on it and lives in, with it uh, on a daily basis. Okay, so here are some of its stiffnesses of belief that we often display. After we are endowed with a set of belief, it's hard for us to change them. Okay, I already believe in something. Why, why are you trying to confuse me with facts? Okay. It's, uh, I don't want to have more information. I feel okay with what I have. Um, so we tend to be avert against seeking more information, okay? Uh, seeking more information is hard for us, not because it's cognitively complicated, right? Uh, why don't, why, why we are avert to be sort of confused by, by facts, right? Why don't we like new evidence, okay? We don't like new evidence because if it points against our original belief, if it tells us, listen, what you thought at the beginning was wrong, there is now more evidence that shows you were wrong. This is something we feel bad about. This is something we are, uh, this is sort of insulting ourselves pointing at our own weakness. And that's why we don't like more evidence. It's, it's not that we are averted to more evidence because we are, you know, we are hurry, we're in a hurry, we have to, uh, we have other things to do. It's not a matter of time and it's not a matter of cognitive uh, load, okay? Many behavioral economists or be, be, behavioral psychologists attribute to avoidance of information to cognitive load. This is nonsense. We don't avoid information because of cognitive load. We avoid additional information because we fear to admit to ourselves and sometimes also to our surrounding that we made a mistake in the first place. This is it. We tend to underestimate, or sometimes, sometimes we are forced to see new evidence <laughs> because 
There's somebody aggressive that puts it in front of us, let's say on Facebook or, another, uh, or through other network or uh, during class, okay? Or during uh, meeting with friends. Somebody is actually telling us a story that points us at uh, point, points out at um, wrong belief that we have. This is very often something that takes place in political debates. Okay, when we um, when we uh, debate a certain ideology or a certain political view. Okay, and somebody says, "No, your 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 your." left ideas about economics are wrong okay and here is the evidence okay or your right ideas your your right wing ideas about economics are wrong here is the evidence okay so we we by that time we're, we we we've already we are already confronted with a piece of evidence what do we do with it what do we do is that very often we underestimate the new evidence that speaks against our initial beliefs for the same reason that I said before. We don't want to admit that we made a mistake in the first place. Sometimes, and this is very extreme, but I'll tell you one example in which it takes place. We often tend to interpret wrong, okay, wrongly new evidence regarded uh, regarding it as a support to our view, where in fact it's against our view. Okay, so sometimes we again are forced to receive new evidence, and and in this new evidence, uh, this new evidence come against our position, original position. Okay. Um, so we can undermine this evidence, but maybe this evidence is, is very reliable, is very prominent. What we do in this case, we, um, we try to find argument that suggests that in fact, this piece of evidence is in favor of our view, okay? Let me give you an example for an experiment, a very nice experiment that has been done to show it. You take, individual and ask them about their position about a certain a certain policy okay controversial policy let's say abortion let's say um, um, capital punishment in the united states some are in favor some are against and you ask them to rank how much in favor they are or how much against they are uh, this policy. Let's say we ask them about capital punishment and we, we tell them zero is absolutely no and 10 is absolutely yes. And five is, I don't have really any idea about it. I don't, I, you know, I'm in the middle, okay? You take this individual, they express their, opinion about the question and then what you do you confront them with evidence and what the, ev the evidence that you confront them with is um, something in the middle so what what they did is they collected pieces of evidence that show both the pros and the cons in capital punishment okay and everybody received the same set of evidence pieces, okay? The point somewhere between in favor or against, okay? Everyone has, everyone's seen the same pieces of evidence. And then the same individual were asked again to rank their opinion after they were confronted with this evidence on the very same question, capital punishment. What do we expect? What do we expect to happen with rational individual? Well, we expect convergence. Those who were extremely in favor of capital punishment, now they see 
uh, ambiguous evidence about it. In particular, they see the, the, the downside of capital punishment. They would move, let's say, from nine to, let's say, seven. Those who were extremely in favor, let's say one, or oh, sorry, the other way around, those who were extremely against would move from one to two, and those who were extremely in favor, let's say nine, now see the downside, they would move um, to, let's say, seven or eight. Okay, that's what we expect when we confront them with the same pieces of information. Instead, what we see in these experiments is that instead of converging, they are diverging. Those who were seven or eight would move to nine, and those who were three or four, sorry, those who were um, three or two would move to one. Okay, how can it be? It can only, be, it can only come from a defense position, okay? I don't want to admit that I was wrong in the first place. So I get the piece of evidence. I have to fight against this piece of evidence. Okay. I have to convince the other party, the experimenter in this case, that I wasn't wrong in my original position. Okay. How can I convince him with, or her with, with something like that? I first to convince myself that my original position was the correct one. So I take this evidence, or basically what I do is I screen out, if, I'm, if my original position was in favor, I screen out all the pieces of information that show against capital punishment. And if my position was, um, was against, I'm screening out every, every bit of information um, that show, uh, the, that show the positive aspect, the, the, the pros, okay? Um, and this is what we often, this, this is what we often do uh, when, um, when we try to, when we try to uh, um, stay or remain or hold very tightly to the original beliefs that we, that we form. Confidence and wishful thinking. Confidence is very much similar to stiffness of belief. This is because when you, when you show stiffness of belief, you also show to some extent overconfidence. You, you say, I know better than this, than these pieces of information. Okay. Um, but there are other forms of, um, of overconfidence and wishful thinking. Okay. Ask people if they believe they are better than drive than the mean, not mean, but but uh, median driver. Okay, so so take a bunch of your friends and ask them, do you think you are better than um, uh, better driver than the median driver in the group? And ask it very broadly to a, to a huge population. This has been done, and what is found is that about ninety percent of the people believe that they are better driver than the median driver, okay? Uh, it can't be the case. You agree? Uh, that's, that's something wrong here, right? But it's not only driving us people, whether they think they're a better cook or they think they're more intelligent than the median individual, okay? Okay, you'll see uh, people um, exaggerating, and they don't really do it in order to impress you. Okay, uh, I mean, if you if you try and use mechanism by which, and there are some experiments that use mechanism like this, that where it's worthwhile for you to say really the truth about what you believe about yourself. Okay, uh, for instance, how do we do it? Um, we, we ask people to predict how skillful they are in a certain skill, okay? And then we ask them to perform the skill and we promise them a payoff, which is increasing the more close they are to their own prediction about their skill, okay? So this, there is incentive here to tell 
the truth about your skills. Otherwise, if you are far-fetched from it, if you are over-exaggerating your skills, you'll get very little money, okay? Still, we see this overconfidence, okay? Okay, overconfidence has evolutionary role. There's some very nice papers, both wishful thinking and, and overconfidence. What is wishful thinking? What's the difference between overconfidence and wishful thinking? Uh, overconfidence concern positive, optimistic beliefs about my own skills or my own ability, okay, or my own performance. Wishful thinking is optimistic beliefs about, about things that can happen on which I have no control. Okay, so they're similar but, but different. Okay, both of them have evolutionary role. Or they, 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 have, they serve some evolutionary purpose. And the main evolutionary purpose that, they, that, for instance, overconfidence is serving is that um, overconfidence also demonstrate power vis-a-vis -vis somebody with whom you are in competition, okay? Or potentially vis-a-vis -vis somebody with whom you want to cooperate, okay? There are gains that occur by demonstrating your power or your ability or by, by uh, over-exaggerating your ability. If it's against a competitor, it might mean that they, this potential competitor will give up before you fight, okay, and disappear, okay? Or alternatively, if it's, um, if it's uh, in, in forming cooperation or definitely in the sphere of mating, right? You want to impress your mate that your offspring will be like you, very talented, very skillful, high performance, right? So there are gains to get. I mean, today, these gains are, are not as possibly huge as they were when we were at the hunt and gather time, but uh, they still occur today. By the way, I don't know if you know this, um, um, uh, who is the person that would, you th would think about, you know, a celebrity which is more, mostly overconfident? And many of us would say Trump, right? I don't know if you know this joke. I don't know if it's correct or not. Um, but there's a story of Trump driving on Highway 1 in the wrong side of the highway, OK? Um, I killed the joke. I killed the joke. So I'm starting it all over again. So he's driving on Highway 1. He's driving on Highway 1. And suddenly there is a phone call in his car and his wife Melinda is calling him and says, Donald, have you just announced on the radio that there's some nut driving on highway one. So be careful. I know you are on this highway. So be careful. There's this nut that drive on the wrong side of the road. So Donald Trump says, what do you mean one person? I see hundreds of them driving in the wrong side of the road. Okay, so this is, um, this is about overconfidence. Okay, evolutionary origin of overconfidence. Um, interesting finding coming from um, clinical psychologists. What they found is that people under depression better assess the likelihood of both negative and positive events compared with non-depressed individual. Okay, what does it mean? If you ask people, both those, well, both people who are under depression, under clinical depression, what is the likelihood that you will be engaged in a car accident in the next few days? And you ask the same question to people who are not depressed, okay? People who are depressed will be more accurate in their prediction. People who are not depressed will be too much with wishful thinking. They would underestimate 
the chances of being involved in a car accident. Okay. Um, alternatively, you ask both depressed people and non-depressed people, what is the chances that if you bought now a lottery card, a lottery ticket, you would win $100,000? Okay. Again, depressed people are more accurate in their prediction. Non-depressed people would be would give an, an overestimation. It would be again too optimistic. Okay, so our our healthy state of mind, okay, is one in which wishful thinking is already built in. We have to be in a clinical depressed state of mind in order to be more accurate, in order to be correct. And that's again points to the adv evolutionary advantage of wishful thinking or overconfidence, right? Because imagine if we knew how, how risky life is and how miserable it, it, it ends up to be. And the fact that we are, you know, we, we are prone to die at some stage, right? And this stage could be very, very close. It could be even tomorrow. If we were totally aware of all these depressing aspects, which indeed depressed individuals are very much focusing on, it wouldn't help our daily routine to be successful, right? So what we are doing is screening away Okay, uh, screening away these negative in pieces of information or negative thoughts, I would say, in order and, and focus only on as much as we are allowed by our cognition on, on, on positive events, on, on positive uh, scenarios, on, on positive beliefs. Now, all these things happen around us in, in many spheres. I mentioned ideology. Indeed, uh, this is probably the area in which stiffness of beliefs is most, uh, uh, is most prominent. I'm going to return to this issue very prominently when we talk about collective emotions or collective rationality. This is going to be one of the lectures toward the end. Um, and uh, uh, this would be one of my explanations for why we are uh, very reacting very irrationally when we uh, choose to whom to vote. Okay, so stiffness of belief and refusing to recognize the truth is very much incorporated in what we call ideology. But it's not only in this sphere that we call ideology, it's also in science. Okay, people who um, uh, subscribe to a certain um, approach in science, whether it's in uh, real science like physics or chemistry or biology or, or um, epidemiology, COVID-19 have shown it very, very prominently. There are people who say this is nothing. This is really a very simple, um, a very simple, uh, cold, okay, um, and insist on this even when we when they see uh, different evidence. There are people who say, you know, this is, you know, that that's that's um, that's even worse than what happened to the world in 1918, okay, uh, which was also which is also wrong, and they make keep with their ideas and, and, and explanation, no matter what evidence they are confronting. So it's very, very much in science, uh, in economics. Economics is a very interesting case because economics is somewhere, uh, is a territory which is somewhere between science and ideology, right? Right, even among us researchers, um, there are people whom you can attribute to be left-oriented as far as economic policy is concerned, and others that are 
over over there at the right right section of of politics and both sides will use um scientific argument but but uh, economics is not only ideology it's primarily a science i mean the, we look at numbers we look at data we look at evidence we look at modeling okay but still stiffness of beliefs applies there at all it applies in in management there, there are different approaches to management to financial strategies um, it's very hard to change uh, approaches to management uh, people you know big man even among big managers uh, or perhaps especially among big managers it's uh, a tough thing to do i talked uh, um, so we finished with the rationality aspect at the level of belief next time we're going to talk it's going to be rationality or bounded rationality at the level of actions and we're going to see that over there, things are even worse, even worse than beliefs. We're doing all sorts of very weird stuff that I might provide some suggestions about how to avoid it. Thank you very much. See you soon.